Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today we're going to bring up a really tender and vulnerable topic for both the analyst and the analysand. It's about when therapy or the analysis ends. And as we were preparing to talk about this, the first thing that became clear is that there is a kaleidoscopic um, variations on when therapy ends and people feel really great about it on both sides, when therapy ends in a way that feels like there's carnage and shrapnel everywhere <laughs> and everything in between. And uh, as analysts, we're left as a final gesture interpreting the ending and making sense of it, at least for ourselves. So we're going to roll up our sleeves and get into this. <laughs> I was going to say something and I just totally forgot what I was going to say. We're all immediately complex <laughs> right now. Hamana, 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 hamana. But I mean, this is interesting what's being constellated and, and really I'm glad it's on the recording because it it is such an enormous process so little has been written about it. Um, I've heard many senior analysts complain that the termination process of analysis is has not been adequately unpacked. And so there is a struggle in it. Well, I mean, I think especially in by Jungians, I think that the object relationists have, have written more about it. I so here's what I remembered was that you know, I know that several listeners have requested specifically like how do I, as an analysand, know when the therapy should end, right? That's a question that people have. One of the things that I'll often do when I first meet with someone is I'll say, you know, what's your imagination about how long we're going to be working together? Because it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't talk about and a lot of people sort of feel, you know, like, oh my God, am I going to be here for the rest of my life? And I always like to let people know that they have ownership over the process and they ultimately get to decide when it's time to go for whatever reason. Of course, it's always, you know, great if they can talk with me about that decision, but uh, I certainly don't see my role as deciding when things are over. It's a little more collaborative. So I think reminding the analysand that, you know, they have power in this decision, because even the initial question of, you know, am I going to be here forever, almost implies that the analyst is going to keep them there forever. And so just reminding them, like, that's, that's really kind of a fiction that's just entered into the room. And we do a bit of reality testing around that. Yeah, it's, it's as if the analyst is the expert. It's kind of like going to the doctor, you know, and the doctor tells you when you're, uh, broken leg or whatever it might be, is finally 100% over and physical therapy is over and you're really good to go. But we don't use that medical model. The analytic model is much more collaborative and the client does own the process really all the way through. It is, it is our role to provide some an interpretive insight and dream analysis and a relational container and a host of other things that will help the analysand uh, understand himself or herself a lot better. So it's, a, it's just a very different process. And I think it ends in all kinds of ways from what you mentioned, Lisa, where it's kind of planned and collaborative and, and mutual to something precipitous and, and unexpected. And I would add, 
I always have feelings about a process terminating. You know, we're, we're human. I'm human. Uh, this is an intimate relationship. It's often one that has gone on for quite some time. That may be some one reason that not a lot has been written about it is that it's, it's hard for us to say that, that it's full of feeling and it, it can end in all kinds of ways. I think that's really important. And a lot of and Alice Sands will defend against that in an ending process. And they'll say things like, well, you only talk to me because I'm paying you. And sometimes in an effort to make the separation less painful, they kind of devalue the relationship. But it is important to, to challenge that and to remind and to confess, in a sense, the incredible reciprocity of the relationship and how much the analyst, the analyst is profoundly affected by the material that's been shared. That when an analysand is sharing their dreams, their life stories, that my soul is populated with these images and feelings, and I'm holding them as if in some way I've kind of generated them and I'm sorting through it in my own body, in my own psyche. So there's a, a tremendous effect that happens with the analyst. And as a matter of fact, as Jungians, is almost required to happen. Jung felt very ambivalently over time relative to this Freudian idea that if the Freudian analyst is perfectly analyzed, that they are totally unaffected by the material that the analysand brings in and that the Freudian analyst should be a blank slate, a kind of absolutely non-responsive um, object in the room. Jung really challenged that. Uh, he came to say that we know in it, and analysis has really been deep because both the analyst and the analysand are different. They're both changed through the process. And Jung worked face-to-face -face while Freud famously sort of sat behind the client on, on a couch. So there's eye contact. We see each other's body movements and facial expressions and all the rest of it. And Jung likened the analytic process to two chemicals in a container, that they really interact with each other and that uh, over time both are changed. We affect each other deeply. Yeah, and it, you know, there's a way that when someone comes in and tells you their story, it, it's like it's yes, it's their story, but it kind of becomes an our story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel invested. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I always struggle with is that supposedly we're not supposed to have desires for our, you know, for our clients, but of course I do. I want, you know, good things to happen to them. And I can't, I, I'm very bad at expunging that. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be neutral, but I'm certainly not. <laughs> you know, I want, <laughs> I want good things to happen. You know, one of the things that I'm sometimes, sometimes clients will sort of say to me, like, how will I know when this is over? And I'll just sort of, one of the things I'll say is, you might just find that you have less energy for it. You know, I think when a, an analysis is really popping, you know, you look forward to it all week and you think about it and you maybe think like, oh, how am I going to explain this to her? You know, oh, oh I've got to remember to tell her this. And it kind of lives in you. And then at some point, maybe just sort of the energy drains away a little bit and you don't find yourself thinking about it with quite the same intensity. And maybe you go and uh, an another, another thing that I notice sometimes is that it starts to feel almost more social where it's a little bit like, let me catch you up with my week. And it just sort of has a, a sort of just so quality to it like that. And I'll start thinking, hmm, we, things might be winding down. Uh, so it has to do with how much energy, I think, gets generated. That's one of the clues. I'm also aware that sometimes when people come in and they say, um, I really don't have anything to talk about this week, or let me catch you up on what happened at work this week or with my kids, that that can also be a time 
where we can start working more with the unconscious because a lot of the history and so on and so forth has been processed enough that it's not what is alive in the person anymore of the the urgency around saying, you know, whatever the life situation is, I need to keep talking about this. I think in the context of our topic of, you know, there's a discernment process about whether it's time to go deeper and there's a doorway that could be opened into something more meaningful or whether it's time for the process to end. Yes, I think it is like a fork in the road. And sometimes one thing is right. And sometimes the other thing is right. And again, I, you know, who has the answer to that question? Well, it would be the it would be the analysis and Mm -hmm. and something for both of us to talk about of what's going on here. And work that through together of I, I think I am finished versus, you know, we'll both know if there's something more below the level of ego that is waiting to emerge. If it's a gratifying ending, it often feels kind of like a graduation. There's this feeling that, yeah, absolutely, that the work feels complete and that both of us feel that there's another adventure which which I'm not going to take with you. And there can be both a sense of nostalgic sadness and even grieving and a sense of almost inevitability and what I'll find in myself is that this loving kind of reverie about the client will take hold in me. Like my soul is kind of determined to continue to imagine them as they move forward. And often there is a lot of gratitude in the field on both sides. I feel it. They feel it. Yeah. And to me, that, that gives me a sense of, oh, yes. I mean, this is kind of heartachy, but, you know, we're really we're moving. And when I look back on those kinds of uh, processes, I can often identify that there was a, a kind of fierce internal conflict that emerged in the an analysis and that something cleared away and then a new and authentic image emerged, a new sense of self a new substantial stance in the world, new capacities that the individual couldn't even have imagined that they've had. And then once that finally consolidates in the life where they have a firm grip on the new piece, there's often kind of a cooling down and a solidification that happens on the new ground. And then that's often a natural time to scan both deeply in, in and also out on the horizon to ask, is there another piece of work that's even called for, either at this stage of life or with me as a kind of companion on the process? And sometimes, of course, or even many times, um, it's not. The other thing that people often want to know is, can I come back if I need to? <laughs> You know, of course they can. Yeah. That rarely happens when people have a really good landing because they're excited about the adventure. They, they want to go into life, or at least that's my experience. Well, I think that there's a sort of strict uh, psychoanalytic tenant that you do this complete termination, you really say goodbye, and there's the sense that the sort of vessel is then sealed but I have found over the course of my uh, years of being an analyst that that doesn't work well for me. And perhaps I'm avoiding saying goodbye, but I do like to let people know that they can check back in, that I will be holding their story. And I find that a lot of people do drop back in sometimes for a single session, sometimes, you know, Four weeks in a row, they come in because something's kind of cooking. But, you know, I find that it works well, at least in, in my estimation, because I do know the story and the background. And so there is this way that I can kind of pick right up again and, oh, this thing is going on. Oh, well, that must be like this. You know, I can sort of knit it back in. And um, I suppose maybe the lesson here is that everyone works a little bit differently in this regard. 
I have had people come back, I think sometimes perhaps uh, just to have the experience of uh, this process and I am still there and still available, that they can come and go, uh, that maybe, um, you know, several years worth of work is finished and then every few months or once a year or something, that person might want to check in with me so that it's not sort of so black and white or, you know, on off that there can still be some back and forth. You know, my hope for people, I like what you were saying about a firm landing and readiness for the next adventure. And I'll add another image to that, which is a a sense of well-being and presence for self that I liken to, you know, going down 100 feet, let's say, underneath the ocean's surface. The waters uh, on the surface can be roiling and stormy and the waves are crashing, but somewhere way down below, there's movement, but those waters are not so disturbed. That's um, a nice image for a steady place Uh, that a person has found in himself or herself. Another place I have found uh, to end with people when, and this is their choice, I was in New York after 9-11 and people came in with some very specific problems related to that terrible catastrophe of, of fear of riding the subway, for example all kinds of things like that, and that that was the topic of, well, you know, we we might, you know, kind of hypothesize that there's more to it than, than simply that, but of four sessions or eight sessions, felt like this is enough, and I've had some support, a month or two has gone by, I'm not feeling the effects of that trauma uh, so keenly. So there can be short-term pieces of work that people do to resolve a particular crisis or life issue, and that's okay too. Yeah, I've had someone come in, you know, with sort of a question, like, I don't know what to do now in regards to this. And we chew on it for, you know, two or three months, and then and then the person really gets to a new place with it. And I feel very clear now what to do with this. And then it's like, okay, so we're moving into another phase of the work, say either there's a break or we drop off to once a month or something like that. So there, there can be all kinds of ways to end, you know, whereas you said, Joseph, it sort of feels like a graduation. I have one story that I, it's probably my favorite termination story. And I did get this person's permission to share it here on the podcast. So We had worked together for many years. For much of that time, we were seeing each other twice a week. So it was, we did a lot of intense work. Then things, you know, were going really well. She was in a really good place. And she she used to come in with tons of dreams every single session. She would have, you know, often two, three, four dreams every single session. So she, we had done a lot of dream work together. She came in one evening And this was the dream. It's four o'clock in the morning and I'm coming to your office for our session. (laughs) And it's four o'clock in the morning, but there you are. And that was the whole dream. And it it was a very different kind of dream than she'd ever brought in before. I initially couldn't make any sense of it and neither could she. We both sort of sat there and then I just had this intuition. And I said, do you think your unconscious is telling us that we're done? And she just started to laugh and that was our last regular session. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was like the unconscious was just saying, like, enough. <laughs> well, maybe it was. I mean, you guys were there, and of course you know it. But for me, how I would interpret that is that the analyst has been internalized. Oh, that's lovely, too. Yeah. That that's one of the effects that some people experience that can be very helpful is, particularly after a long analysis, that uh, there might be a... Um, then a break for one reason or another. But the analysand feels that they're still talking to this inner analyst. Yeah. I'm available at any hour of the day. Because exactly. It's, because yeah. <laughs> you're in her, you're in her imagination now, and you're 
kind of a function that which Jung called the psychopomp, that this internal guide of the soul now has a kind of nice, crisp form that the ego can really rely on, and they no longer need an outer analyst to kind of keep reinforcing it. But it definitely was the unconscious let us know. Yeah. However, there are other terminations that are not as satisfying as this, and I I think every therapist and every analyst has had uh, his or her share of, of those where it's not a good fit or something happens and the client or analysand leaves precipitously and, and things don't feel complete. Or, or they feel terrible. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is something that analysts struggle with perhaps even more than other kinds of psychotherapies, because in analysis, we are looking for an activation of unconscious content. We're not looking for things to be smooth and easy. We're not just tossing a few strategies out. We and the client are putting our hands deep into the mud. And when things activate, there's an enormous intensity of feeling and very old material that, by the way, has probably been put to sleep down in the unconscious, although it's been causing a problem. So when things begin to heat up and there's enormous feelings and often primal feelings of hatred and love and violence and uh, all kinds of primal needs begin to surge into the room, there is this um, struggle to kind of keep the analysis on track, to hold the right attitude, to hold the container. And, and some clients will either not tolerate that or the material won't tolerate being held. Mm -hmm. and, and then people can wind up shouting and being enraged and, and throwing all kinds of invectives at the analyst. And in a sense, what they're doing is they're pushing all of this painful, passionate material into the analyst and unconsciously fantasizing that if they shut the door on it and run out of the door, that then it's going to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're out of dodge. Yeah. I, I think I want to say first that it's not that this process is made by the analyst to be especially intense. It's not that we're, you know, sort of poking and prodding to light fires in someone. But when we're working with the unconscious, old wounds and feelings and relational patterns are going to emerge in what we call the transference. And if it's the analyst feeling the feelings, it's called the countertransference. But it's just all of the multifaceted and deep stuff of relationship um, in the kind of container and context that an analysis can provide. I know I always say to people who come in the first or second time that if something happens that really affects you, you know, in any kind of negative way, it rubbed you the wrong way, you thought about it later, you didn't like it, notice what your feelings are and please bring it back. If not in this session, then the next session because that is part of analysis. It's, it's on the table, and let's work it out together. I will meet you there. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to agree, but that's important material for us to be curious about and to explore. This is a deeply relational process, and old wounds around relationship and patterns and repetitions are supposed to come up. Yeah, and when those things happen and we get pulled into sort of playing an old role or or our stuff gets activated. Yeah, that, that happens, happens too. too. <laughs> or we're being cast in that role. Mm -hmm. Or yes, we call that an enactment. When an enactment arises, it can be such a rich opportunity because boy, you're you're really you've really hit pay dirt then. You know, you're really right in the thick of it. But sometimes a repair, for whatever reason, cannot be made. That's always a really hard thing 
because oftentimes someone will leave treatment then on on very bad terms and it feels like a lost opportunity and and uh it just it feels it feels sad well it certainly feels sad and incomplete in that sense that that we could have worked this through and my concern is always that this is one more repetition and it's going to repeat again somewhere down the road. We could have worked this through. We could have, we had an opportunity to lift something into consciousness together. And so it's always especially hurtful when someone just cuts it off, which is such an unsatisfying, frustrating way of resolving a conflict. It's also violent. Mm. There's a certain, just like if you were, I don't know, you were married to somebody and then one day you just announced you're leaving and your bags are in the car and you're driving away and you never talk to them again. I mean, we have stories of that kind of violent dissociating process. And again, I think it has something to do with shutting down or the fantasy that they will then shut something down. I, I think that the inoculation that can help people not fall into that is if they're introduced to the, uh, the idea of the symbolic attitude, that everything that we're reacting to in the environment is actually a kind of symbolic process that's going, in, going on inside of us. That even though you know certain behaviors or th certain things may be said in the analysis or in, in the office for that matter, or in the family, that we can observe the phenomena and maybe we think it's wise or unwise or clumsy or skilled as we're evaluating people's behavior around us. But when we have volcanic feelings that rise up, the real test is, can the analysand know that this is all about them? Can they claim it as a phenomena of their own psyche, which is grist for the mill? that is actually kind of the prima materia that could be turned into gold if they're willing or if they have the muscle to see it in that way. So when the analysand thinks that everything is happening to them or everything is happening across the room, then it's hard often to keep them in the heat of a really difficult process. And with that said, I will also say that there are times when I think it's important and just plain honest to say what they're perceiving ha in me uh, has some truth in it, that I can understand that the comment that I made that was well-intentioned, no doubt, could have been heard in a way that felt, uh, you know, critical or dismissive or something. So that that part of the relationship, uh, I'm in it, and I'm willing to disclose what my inner world was like in that moment uh, so that it's not a mystery uh, and the client doesn't feel once again of, you know, hey, it's you, like a parent or other authority figure who's always right. But I th that's wonderful to make sense of what the analysis and psyche might be reacting to. The reaction is still always that person's responsibility, but the object they're reacting to is not always just fantastical. Things are happening in the room and things are happening in the analyst for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I, I agree with you, Deb, and I think it's, that's really important because that's how, you know, you, you stay connected with someone as well. And I was there and, and this is my part. And I, and I want to say too, I mean, I think there's just a part of me that wants to say, I certainly make mistakes sometimes, but I don't think I've done anything that's a terrible, awful, ethical trespass. But, you know, that happens sometimes. I mean, I think, when, you know, when your therapist uh, invites you to have sex with him, that's not, that, that's actually a thing that you should have a big reaction to, for example, mm -hmm. you know? So it, that I just want to, I would just want to say that it's not, it's not like we're infallible over on our side of the room. I'm aware that as we talk about when therapy ends and the various ways it can end, we're also always going back into the relational container. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So it, it's like heads and tails of the same coin. We can't talk about how or when it ends without talking about the relationship itself that we've had and its satisfactions or its problematic features. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. I'd also like to add a kind of archetypal dimension that some of the things that activate in the analysis end are really transpersonal and are utterly surprising and may not be rising up from the field of a lived experience. And Jung called these archetypal activations, uh, or if we wanted to be really poetic, you know, it's this kind of awakening of the ancient gods somewhere in the unconscious and these huge unprecedented images and feelings and fantasies, you know, start filling the room or start filling the person in a way that feels really earthquaking in the psyche. I mean, sometimes that can be problematic, but sometimes it portends an an emergence of a radically new way of being in the world. And there's often this kind of moment in that journey where the analysand needs to choose to be changed by this internal process. And not infrequently, people will leave the analysis in order to do a regressive restoration of the persona, that the new change, the potential in them just feels so frightening, so unbelievable, that they leave so they can return to the life that they're familiar with. So it's sort of a refusal of the call, as it were. And again, that is in the in the individual's hands. I mean, that. I mean, in one sense, I was going to say that it's their choice. You know, is it a choice? Is it just a, uh, admitting somebody only has but so much internal resources at a given moment? Or the time is just not right. The time. We sometimes just don't know. You know, that's another way that therapy can end, along with a couple of things we haven't really touched on yet, which is when one or the other person has to relocate. Yes. Or falls ill or Mm -hmm. dies. Mm -hmm. And I know I have had that happen to me. And it is simply shocking. Mm -hmm. It's, It's a real... A grief when an analysand dies. And I had a supervisor who died suddenly and mm-hmm. could not keep her appointment, and I did not know. Th- those are such jolting experiences, whether one is the client uh, or the analyst. Mm-hmm. And it does happen. It certainly does. A friend of mine had um, shockingly, over the course of his work, have two of his analysts pass away unexpectedly. And it constellated this um, overwhelming feeling of being orphaned. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. That then became this kind of burden that, that was his next piece of work. We can talk about synchronicity in those moments, you know, why that person, why that analyst, the unconscious is generally aware that there is something happening in the room, that the analyst has a portending illness, because our bodies are communicating in these subtle ways. So we, we often have to, maybe years later, tolerate the discussion of, you know, who am I such that this would happen to me? Mm-hmm. Who am I such that I would choose two analysts who have these underlying uh, foreboding situations and and that there is perhaps a painful but there is some kind of a fateful meaning even in these terrible tragedies right that somehow that was the fate the person needed to live out in some way or the person simply needs to come to terms with the fact that this happened that life can deal us some surprising, sad uh, blows. and But still the question is, what do we do with, with that? I know um, in both of those cases of lo- losing an analysand and a supervisor, 
I was introduced to a sharpness of grief that I could not make sense of. Hmm. It took me way below the level of, of anything that my ego could possibly parse out. And there have been deaths in, you know, with family members, grandparents and parents and so on, um, that, that did not have that particular bite to it. Uh, because there was no opportunity to have any kind of process or closure around these these losses. So it's another way therapy can end is with this awful sort of cutting off that that comes so unexpectedly. And a relationship that was there is just not there at all. And we cannot go to the person's family. So we grieve alone. Yes. Mm-hmm. And in a certain sense, when we've had a long analytic practice, that is inevitable because people who are in crisis tend to seek out support. They tend to seek out analysts. And so over the course of our careers, some of us have had many people that come having discovered a terminal illness, wanting to prepare and to engage this last leg of their journey. So analysts frequently hold um, this grieving process that hold hold death in their minds and in their hearts as they're doing the work. Yeah, that's a different process when a, a stated part of the process of someone who has a terminal illness and and then we know uh, that we will see them through that to the great crossing uh, versus something that's unexpected. I'm aware, too, that another kind of ending can come about when someone has a real reversal in life and simply has no more money uh, to afford the process. And I know for me that is a particularly sticky place. What do we do about that? Mm, yes, that is very hard. It is incredibly hard, and I always want to be able to serve the process somehow together. How do we honor psyche in this kind of sudden um, circumstantial reversal as somebody gets fired or there's you know some other kind of family crisis and it's always possible to discuss altering the fee or suspending a fee for a time. Uh, there, there are lots of options. Uh, again, trying to avoid that sudden cutting, cutting off. And yet there's also a business side to our business. And that can be a way that therapy maybe ends or is perhaps sort of suspended for a time until circumstances can change back and a process can resume. I find when people bring up financial concerns at some point in the journey, my first response is to just be very curious. Mm. I've certainly seen many times when finances become a kind of excuse to flee because they, they really don't want to talk about the underlying issue. So then they create money as an issue. Sometimes I've heard some analysts um, say that they'll often question whether or not the client feels worthy of investing those that money in themselves, that there's a, a conflict of worthiness. Sometimes the money takes on a certain kind of symbolic value mm -hmm. in the room that becomes really troubling. As we said earlier, writing the check and translating it over to the analysis becomes kind of pregnant with a kind of meaning that's deeply disruptive. For instance, as I said before, each time the analysis makes a payment, it's they take it as proof that the relationship isn't real or that they can't be loved, so they have to pay for love. So sometimes there's a very complicated or painful, toxic meaning that's suddenly emerging around the transaction on that dimension. So it feels, it's always very complicated to me. But of course, Deb, you're talking about situations of a true reversal of, of fortune. Mm -hmm. 
But I agree. There's a that's another very complex uh, situation of the whole huge range of possibilities and things to be understood and and explored. You know, as we're uh, kind of winding up, I'd love, love to just introduce a topic topic because I think people might appreciate it. Is if we were to give advice to somebody about what is a wholesome way to bring a closure to their therapy, what would we suggest to them so that they might orient themselves to have perhaps a really positive process here at the at the end of things? Well, I think it would depend in part on, you know, the person's reason for wanting to leave. I do think ideally it's something that you take to the analyst and just say, you know, how you're feeling, what you're thinking, what your plan is, and and hopefully there's room to have a process around ending. You know, so I think best of all, you've got at least a session or two to sort of review the work that was done to maybe look forward a little bit together, to sort of um, knit it up, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, I would like, you know, as with everything else, that in a way we we do it in the consulting room, we do it together, where the meaning was, where the changes are, what have you, whoever the you is, taken from this process so that it's spoken aloud and now that person can know in a felt way between us of, and I have this. And it used to be like that, but now I feel quite differently about it. Of like, now it's stated that all that is kind of really resides inside the person. That That's a, a way of people really having another way of knowing they're more whole and 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 then the goodbye um, is not as if anything is really being left uh, with me or in our uh, space. Absolutely, I, I think of one one ending process that I I think back really fondly and actually really enjoyed is that the person came in and they retold the arc of the analysis as if mm. it were kind of a travel log. Oh. And they gave themselves a good four or five sessions, and they came in with their journal, and they they reflected on poems they had written, and the two of us, you know, rejourneyed in a very edited way, you know, where it started, um, significant scenery that we had seen together, and kind of where the client felt that they had arrived, and I had this, you know, wonderful sense of a full circle. And I actually really felt that the psyche, that the psyche and or the self was really helping both of us. I felt deeply aided in the transition to letting go as well. It felt like it felt so graceful to me. And I still feel so appreciative of that. There are all kinds of ways to say goodbye. And I think that in itself is um, part of the ending of how do you say goodbye? How do we do this? By just not showing up for the last few sessions or, you know, some issue comes up with the analyst that says, you know, okay, that's it, I'm done. Or is there a way that that uh, you can say goodbye in this really fulsome way that you were just describing, Joseph, but one way or another, we're going to say goodbye. You know, I do want to say, though, that uh, that's something that comes up a lot for, for me is people being really afraid that they'll have to leave before they're ready. Hmm. And, and sometimes when people are starting to get a little better, they'll even say, you know, we, we might comment together, wow, this is really, you know, you're, this is, things are turning around for you. That's great. And there might even be a reaction, oh, but does that mean I can't come anymore? So a lot of people will want reassurances from me that they don't have to leave or I'm not going to kick them out or anything like that. I guess I just sort of go back to, and it's your decision. Yeah. It's and your decision. Yes, of course it is, uh, because we're all sovereign beings. There also are times when the analyst will decide that the process should end. 
that um, just recently at the IAB conference in Vienna, there's a big international Jungian conference that there was a, a well-known analyst named Verena Kast who was there. She talked about a lot of wonderful things. And one of the things she landed at the end is that when the analyst discerns that they have lost their friendly eye towards the psyche of the analysand, then it is ethical for the analyst to terminate the process. That the analyst is also capable of discerning that the stream has soured, the river's polluted, something unwholesome is happening here. And diagnostically, it is kind of humane to just say, you know, whatever work we could do is finished. And that might be very surprising for the analysis, but but it can be also a form of grace. Yeah, it's it's honest. And that brings in, uh, you know, when an analyst retires at some age um, for a whole variety of reasons, people do close their practices and that may leave some of their clients feeling, you know, that I wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And that that too, that's a real loss uh, and a real disappointment of uh, for a process that's so important uh, to once again, you know, kind of repeat what's probably in the history of I didn't get my full share. Yes, abandoned. Mm. They can interpret that way, but it also can be really shocking that after years of the client's needs being the primary consideration in the room, that they discover that the analyst has needs. Mm -hmm. That the analyst all of a sudden becomes real. It's like, I'm tired, I'm old, I, I want to move to Miami, <laughs> just be on the beach for the last couple of years. And just uh, uh, for the analyst and to realize, oh my gosh, yeah, you know, this is a person you know, across the room, which is, I think, both healing and shocking, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but hopefully there's been enough notice given, unless there's a sudden illness or something, that in another year or whatever the time frame might be, I will be retiring so that there can be some preparation. Yeah, the but, garden can be tilled. Mm -hmm. Lots of ways in which therapy can end, and maybe it's time for our discussion of that to move on to a dream. Another ending. Another. <laughs> Hi, this is Deb from This Jungian Life Podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Today's dream, um, the dreamer is a 35-year-old male, and he is a poker player. And here's the dream. I'm a student in a classroom. I recognize one student, someone I know who, like me, has a talent for deception and manipulation, but he is malicious and I am not. I've put a lot of work into not letting these aspects of myself run amok. This student is clearly not interested in the class and doesn't want to be here. I then realize this is a sort of personality class that we've been assigned because of our troubling traits. The teacher, a female I don't recognize, is on the verge of tears as she flips through a stack of papers, which I understand to be transcripts of conversations between this other student 
and people he's treated badly, using their secrets against them, things like that. Another student leans over to me and whispers, she's going through yours next. And I say, but I don't do things like that. The teacher looks up at me, still visibly upset, about to cry. She says to me, you're supposed to come back next week, right? Well, don't come. I don't have time to spend on a mailbox student like you. And I say to her, the way you're feeling right now, I've been making people feel like that my whole life, and I'm very sorry. Context of the dream. I've been working very hard on integrating difficult parts of myself. I struggle with empathy sometimes. Earlier this year, my wife had a miscarriage when we were trying to conceive, and we had a hard time over my seeming to get over it very quickly, where she had an extremely difficult time. Uh, and then the main feelings in the dream, something like confusion. I felt like I didn't truly belong in the class and the teacher was also annoyed, like she has her hands full with students who need this and didn't have time for someone like me who was getting along without it, something like that. And the dreamer was very interested in this, uh, in this, in this uh, reference to a mailbox and was wondering about different possible things that that could mean. I think it's extraordinary also that the occupation of the dreamer is a poker player. I, mean, I don't know <laughs> that I've ever met a professional poker player, so I'm immediately besieged by all kinds of fantasies that may have nothing <laughs> to do with reality. Um, so that's a challenge you know, here because it kind of excites my imagination in a certain way. <laughs> Yes, well, it certainly seemed relevant, right? Because, you know, he knows that he has a talent for deception and manipulation. Um, I thought it was so interesting that there are these two students, right? I mean, it immediately sets up a kind of doppelganger kind of thing, which would which would be shadow. So there's, you know, the dream ego, which is um, trying to be conscious of uh, this tendency to manipulate or deceive. And then there's this other part that just is there nonetheless, in spite of the ego's attempts to become conscious of it, there the shadow is all the same. And there is sometimes a fantasy around inner work that just becoming consciousness of it is the work. And, and, and that often is not adequate, that we become aware of something like this kind of malevolent trickster, this kind of murderous Loki you know, in the North myth, Norse mythology. And then there's a confrontation with the shadow. And the confrontation can be to extract a seed of positive potential, because there are some environments where the trickster is life-giving and life-renewing and life-protecting, and also to confront and contain the shadow in as much as it can be horrendously antisocial and destructive and can't be allowed to maraud around one's life. So just being aware sets the stage, but the drama has to really continue. And the ego has to decide what its moral stance is. And by moral, I don't mean an assigned morality. It doesn't always have to look like, for instance, a, a traditional Christian morality, but that one has to develop a moral stance in as much as what is permissible and not. I'm aware um, I haven't said anything yet about this dream. And uh, what I'm paying attention to is my own reaction to it um, as a place for me to sort of think about hmm, what's going on here that in the dynamic between the dream and, and myself. Uh, I am very disturbed by this dream. It's dark. There's some way... Um, that there is this deceptive uh, quality of there's a shadow figure, someone I know who, like me, has a talent for deception and manipulation, but he's malicious and I'm not. You know, the, the implication here is that this is another male, although he doesn't say that. But there's a sh this is a shadow figure, which means, you know, usually that that other figure in the dream is another part of the dreamer that feels like not me, but usually all aspects of the dream are aspects of the dreamer. 
and the teacher is a female on the verge of tears. And this shadow student has treated other people badly, using their secrets against them. The teacher is female, and the dreamer's wife, of course, is female, who has uh, suffered the miscarriage. And our dreamer is a poker player. So we all know about the need to be, you know, bluff and kind of have a poker face and, and all of that stuff. You know, although the dreamer says I'm working hard on integrating difficult parts of myself and he struggles with empathy, um, I, I wonder if um, the conscious position is really very different from what's going on in the psyche. That the conscious position is, I'm I'm trying very hard not to do these terrible things, but yes. somehow, yeah. And and I I get that, Deb. And I I also hold a slight, a sort of almost an opposite potential. Okay. Um, and of course, we don't we don't know the streamers, so we don't know. But if you sort of think about our axiom that the the least trustworthy uh, attitude in the dream is that of the dream ego. So the dream ego is very sorry. And um, the dream ego recognizes that this other student is bad and, uh, you know, sort of feels badly about what this, how this teacher is, is, um, is feeling. The dreamer mentions that his wife had a miscarriage and he wasn't as upset by it as she was. Well, this is something that I know that this is not uncommon in couples where there's a miscarriage, that the woman whose body has been through this experiences it profoundly. And sometimes the father does as well, but not always. It may be that there's a little bit of a story that he's um, bad at empathy and he's um, you know hurting women, for example, his wife by not being empathic enough. But but I don't know that that lines up with reality. So it, it may be that this kind of um, identification, the self-identification is deception, being deceptive and manipulative. I mean, it's, it's possibly true, but uh, it's also possibly true that these are qualities that have somehow been assigned to this person that he's identified with. So as you're talking, you know, I'm going back to the possibility of kind of early childhood wounding that somehow is is trying to be brought forward. So if I just squint a little bit and I think of this female figure as his mother instead of the teacher, you know, and they're in this class and the mother is perhaps um, examining him or looking at him and the feeling towards him is that you're not even quite real. You're not even a person. All you are is a box that things get stuffed in and things get taken out of. And, you know, I'm disgusted with you and I don't want you around me. So what if the mother complex's view of him is that he's nothing more than a transitional box that's useful or not useful to keep the mail dry? And and then, so I think, I mean, I'm imposing all this fantasy on it, but of course, we all we all you know, that's what we're doing. <laughs> but so I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, what what does a psyche feel like? What does it look like? What would a child function like if it were perceived that way contemptuously by a primary caregiver? Yeah, that's really interesting because there is contempt, isn't there, in in this in this attitude of the teacher? So this stripping of value that perhaps, you know, you're my little boy or you're my boy, but I don't see you as anything more than a shell. And then what does the child activate or what archetypally might activate in them to try to survive that kind of hostility from a caregiver? And I think being tricky and manipulative could be a way of surviving in that kind of world. Because we have to survive. And if we can't receive what we need through the beneficence of a caregiver, then we have to be tricky, cloying, um, arm twisting to try to make sure that we get to get what we need emotionally. We to- might even um, decide that we need to sort of live out our, sh- you know, a sort of shadow qualities. You know, that's kind of what you're 
you're saying about some people kind of live out their shadow and and the the good qualities, quote unquote, those are the ones that are in the unconscious. Yeah, I think that's what I was kind of picking up on is there's the dream ego who's in this class and realizes he's been assigned to it because of troubling traits and who can apologize to the teacher at the end um, and who can say, I'm not malicious, but this other student is. And the part I'm interested in too is the other student is also the dreamer. Yeah. And then we do have this kind of punitive, well, the teacher has been hurt. He says twice that she's on the verge of tears and then she's about to cry. So by the time she sort of uh, strikes out, as it were, and says, don't come back, I don't have time for mailbox students, uh, she's been hurt first. I'm curious about where and how this dreamer would identify with this supposed other student who's who's not him, but who does bring about these kinds of uh, reactions from people. Well, he has a parenthetic comment um, where he says, you know, the other dreamer, the other figure is malicious. I, I am not. Parenthetically, I've put a lot of work into not letting these aspects of myself run amok. So he actually does have a sense of this potential or has known this part of himself. Mm-hmm. I, I still want to, I'm caught in this fantasy of of something being happening with the female figure and then the child trying to figure out or believe that it must have something to do with them. So the other image that happened to me is of a mom who has postpartum depression, that a mom who's just sorting through papers or she's just sorting through the, her day-to-day life and dissolving in tears and just being in the house or just knowing she has babies to take care of is just overwhelming. And the only thing, the only response she has to the baby is just get away from me. Don't come back. Just don't come back in the room but and don't come back over and over and over again. And And I have to say that this kind of lack of access to the feminine, it's a kind of refusal to be engaged or a kind of sin of omission for children where the mother is inaccessible, um, can create all kinds of difficulties. And one of the difficulties he notices is that he doesn't have access to feeling very well or, or feelings. Yes, yeah. Here's something that, that I'm noticing. So we have three paragraphs. And the first paragraph, he, he says, he is malicious and I am not. So there's this sort of, you know, we're, we're different. I'm not that thing. And in the next paragraph, it ends with, oh, she's going to go through your papers next. And the dreamer says, but I don't do things like that. So again, a sort of disavowal. At the end of the third paragraph, which is also the end of the dream, he says, the way you're feeling right now, I've been making people feel like that my whole life and I'm very sorry. So he is claiming that he's made people feel badly. So there seems to be some kind of uh, owning of perhaps these shadow qualities or this tendency to make people feel badly. And I want to point something else out too, which is he brings up empathy in his associations, but this teacher, which of course is an aspect of his psyche, is highly empathic because she's on the verge of tears just simply uh, flipping through a stack of papers, which are transcripts. And then the dreamer himself expresses empathy, the way you're feeling right now I've been making people feel like that my whole life, and I'm very sorry. But I want to ask, okay. why Why do you assume that the female figure is feeling empathy just because she's dissolving into tears? Well, I, maybe that is an assumption, but that's the, way, that's the way I read it. She is on the verge of tears as she flips through a stack of papers, which I understand to be transcripts of conversations. So I, I, I mean, I am making an assumption that it's, it's because of the tears. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's because of the content of the transcripts that she's in mm-hmm. tears. Maybe that's, maybe I'm making a false assumption. The one thing that we know for sure in this dream is that, you know, there is a, a real problematic relationship between him and the teacher. 
and that he is a bad object. A and he also, at the end, owns his part in it. I've been making people feel that way um, my whole life. And then we have his shadow, uh, the other student, uh, who is malicious. So, you know, that's in the dream, too, of, uh, you know, there, this is not, you know, sort of an innocent little lamb here who's accidentally sort of tripping over the traces. And maybe the female part, I mean, it seems, you know, if I were really literalizing it, uh, she's on the verge of tears flipping through a stack of papers. I mean, that's maybe a little over-emotional. So we have um, sort of under-emotional and unfeeling. And then we have a teacher who, a female figure who um, may be over-emotional and a little bit too prone to being terribly, terribly wounded. It seems a little out of proportion to the situation. Um, and then perhaps a little bit of a rapprochement at the end where he says, um, I've been doing this my whole life, making people feel this way, and I'm sorry. Uh, so there may be a, a, a hint of a resolution here of uh, taking responsibility and making an empathic statement. Yes, but, you know, it, I mean, it is difficult to know exactly where to place this dream without really knowing the dreamer, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's like this maze. Yeah. yeah. Joseph, I liked your idea about the mailbox, right. that it's a thing and it's a repository. And it's empty. It's hollow. <laughs> yes. Right. It has no real identity. No, exactly. Yeah. It has no um, sense of self. It, it, it's uh, the pass through for other people's stuff. Yes. Right. That's it just perfect. has utility. However, I have to say, I am, uh, I think, a little unsettled by the fact that this person is a poker player. Uh, that had quite an impact on me. Mm -hmm. And partly I'm curious about it of like, you know, wow, you could really make a living playing poker. And, you know, do you travel out to Las Vegas or wherever these tournaments are held and, and play poker? And another part of me goes, what is that about? Of, of, of this is, I guess it's categorized as a sport, but it does have deception built right into it. It's a tricking game for sure, and a bluffing yeah. game, and a accounting game. People have to be kind of brilliant to make yes. a living at it. Yes, yes. I, I had a, I have a friend who was a professional poker player for a while, and I was very curious when I found that out and asked him lots of questions about it. But yes, you know, you have to be brilliant. You have to be both kind of mathematically astute and also very psychologically astute, and have a high risk tolerance. Uh, but psychologically astute, but not emotional. You have to be manipulative and a little bit, I don't know what, a little, there has to be a little bit of a streak of sociopathy or something to really play the game in this uh, incredibly unfeeling way. Because if you get sentimental or emotional about it, you, you don't play well. I This is my fantasy. I've I don't play poker, <laughs> um, but you know there are all those card shark movies and so on. Anyway, it, so here's somebody that wants to become more empathic. It's in the dream and with his wife and the miscarriage, and and he says they're about to have a baby um, who's perfectly healthy. So he needs more connection with his feeling function. And at the same time, whenever he goes to work, he can't afford any connection with his feeling. Well, function. And I would, I would argue that the poker being a poker player is hardly the only field where that is true. Oh, good point. <laughs> but, but yes, I mean, Deb, I think you just said something really important that, you know, he's looking for more connection with his feeling function. And I do think that that happens in the dream. I do think that happens. Well, it's funny, that last sentence, the way you're feeling right now, I make people feeling like that. That's also an astute trickstery statement. You know, could people, be. Could be. No car salesmen will develop this um, active listening skill set because they're astute. What I want to come back to in the dream, which, which makes me empathic for the fellow, is that he believes and thinks he has evidence that he is unlovable. That he's just mm -hmm. so bad mm -hmm. yeah. that the only response for the feminine is just get out of the room. 
Yeah. That, that he's so disgusting to this woman. He may be feeling that a little bit from his wife right now, that she's so kind of distraught and angry, appalled that he's not having her feelings. So I really want to sit with that as a reenactment of the childhood that you are only valuable if you have my feelings, which turns you into a mailbox. Mm -hmm. That I can just put something into you. And if you're not going to carry my feelings, little boy, then you have no use. Get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. And kids are raised that way sometimes, particularly by highly narcissistic parents. When kids are raised in that environment, they do become highly narcissistic and uh, malignant narcissism can make people uh, feel or act in a predatory way. Mm -hmm. I feel a certain satisfaction with what the dream might be saying in relationship to his marriage. And it, it evokes, strangely enough, it evokes a kind of love for him if I see him as a little boy, <laughs> not as a dangerous person. In the same way that little boys can be, you know, real stinkers, of course. You know, you guys had little boys and you might have been at your wit's end, but somehow you communicated that you were going to love them no matter how stinky they were. And I get the feeling this guy never got that. I think that may uh, take us to a place where we are um, coming to a close for this week. Yeah, I would say that for once, Joseph, I completely agree with you on the stream interpretation. So we should probably just quit while we're ahead. What a relief. I'm a full mailbox now. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.